Last week, Pastor Greg, my dad, I still always find it hard to call him Pastor Greg when he's my dad. But, you know, that's right. We'll do both. Pastor Dad. How's that? <laughs> Everyone say Pastor Dad. Pastor dad. That's right. It's honouring, it's pastoral, and it's, it's Dad, your dad. <laughs> but last week, he spoke on the parable of the little murex. And for those of you who don't know what a murex is, it's one of the blandest, most looking sea creatures, sea shell creatures in the whole of the ocean. And uh, my son Ari loves looking at these. When we go to Yamba, he looks on the beach and he sees the little shells. And sure enough, in the Middle East region, you'll find this little murex that looks like nothing special at all. And yet what it produces is one of the only legitimate colours of blue that gets used in things that are absolutely holy. It gets used in the uh, cords of the uh, robes and the tzitzit of the Jewish people, the Levites, the priests. And it's used, this colour, this authentic blue colour is used for such wonderful, holy purposes. And as Dad was telling this parable, he said, you know, some of us feel like we are such plain old human beings or plain young human beings. And yet the fact of the matter is in every one of us is, an, is a type of blue what the Lord wants to use for His holiness. He wants to extract something from you for His holiness. Every person, every one of us has a purpose whether young or not, and if you still have breath in your lungs, if you're still alive, you've not retired to the grave, then you still have the purpose of holiness. So everyone just say with me, say, I'm alive, I'm alive. and I have purpose. I have purpose. You are the murex. But what happens if the murex loses its blue ability? It becomes unpurposeful. It dies. There's a scarlet, there's a red worm, a worm that produces a scarlet color. What happens if it loses its ability to produce scarlet? It just becomes any other worm. What happens to salt in the scripture if it loses its saltiness? It's thrown out. Have you ever tried a meal without salt and thought, gee, this could do with some salt? And you go to pour the salt on and it's actually pepper? There's a feeling. It is. You face disappointment, don't you? Have, you know, like you're disappointed immediately. You're like, I wasn't feeling pepper, I was feeling salt. And it's the same with us. God has a purpose for us, but it's our responsibility to retain hold of the purpose so God can bring it out. It's our responsibility to act on that purpose so God can bring it out. And it's on that purpose that I want to talk today. Uh, God has a window of opportunity for each and every one of us. And that window of opportunity Often, you know this, and I, it's not lost on me that I chose a door instead of a window, but just imagine it's a window, okay? Um, you didn't notice? Okay, well, that, now you do. God provides windows of opportunity for us to be involved in His plans. Many of you who've been long-term believers, you know this to be true. You, you've responded to God in incredible ways when He's given you a word in a moment and you've taken it, but then there have also been times when you've missed that window of opportunity, and how do you feel? I know if I've ever missed that window of opportunity, I've been filled with regret. What's happened? How have I lost out in this? And God's plans are not dependent on you. you know, we need to understand that for just a quick moment. God's plans are not dependent on whether you jump in or whether you don't jump in. It's a terrible thought that God's not waiting on you. We're all waiting on the Lord, but God's not waiting on us. He's patient with us. But he's not waiting to fulfill his plans by waiting on you. He's patient with you, yes, but he's not waiting on you. Psalms 33 verses 1 says, The plans of the Lord stand firm forever and the purposes of his heart through all generations. In other words, we're good at creating our plans, but it's actually the Lord's plans that matter. Imagine for a moment I said, I'm going to start my own business and I'm going to do all of this and I'm going to have this great life. And now I'm going to see how God wants to fit into it. That's not how it works. God has his plans and he says, if you consult me and work with me, you'll fit my, your plans into my plans. Proverbs 16, 3 to 4 says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Which means, folks, friends, family, visitors, you weren't made for your own purpose. You were made for God's purposes. So the point... First of all, is if there's a purpose in you, how do we activate that purpose? And how do we remain in that purpose? The first thing this morning, the first point I want to make is that attitude is everything. Numbers 8 verses 23, I want to talk to you about the Levites for a moment. The reason I want to talk about the Levites is they represented people who were set apart to the Lord. 
like disciples, they were preparing people for the presence of God and they were preparing God for people's presence. They were wanting to bring communion of the two. Numbers 8 verses 23 to 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, This applies to the Levites from 25 years old and upward. They shall come to do duty in the service of the tent of meeting. And from the age of 50 years, they shall withdraw from the duty of the service and serve no more. They minister to their brothers in the tent of meeting by keeping guard, but they shall do no service. Thus you shall do to the, Lev- uh, do to the Levites in assigning their duties. So let's talk about the Levites for a moment. Everyone okay if we chat about Levites, who they are, what they represent? So these Levites were people serving in the temple. If we were to make a modern day comparison, that's like disciples serving, bringing people close to God. This is not about pastors or priests necessarily. This is about people set aside for God. And the main desire is they want to bring people closer. When you invite someone to church, you want to bring them closer to the presence of God so that they can look on the Son who is Jesus and believe. From the age of 13 to 24, these Levite men, and I say men, you might look at me and say, how are they men at 13? This is what the Bible says. The Bible tells us, and we were exploring on the Torah portion just yesterday uh, with Pastor Greg, how youth does exist in the Bible. Now, it was a, it was a surprise to me that this youth age does exist. We, we, I've often wondered, where did youth come from in the Bible? I always see men, women, but where do youth come from? Well, we discovered that there is an age for youth. Do you want to know how old a youth boy and a youth girl is? Yes? I'll tell you, Teresa. <laughs> The age of a youth boy is between 12 years and 6 months and 13 years of age. So if you have a child who's 12 years and 6 months and between that age and 13, I believe Finn is somewhere and he's that age upstairs. He's gone upstairs. He ran because he knew I was going (laughs) to... No, no, he did. (laughs) Then that's what's called youth ministry in the Bible. Why? Because they're not children, they're learning how to make their own decisions. But by 13, the Bible calls them to an account as a man. What they say is binding. God takes their vows as vows. He takes their oaths as oaths. He treats them, God treats that young man as a man. Now, this is a total cultural flip for our society today, isn't it? We, like, we, we, want 18, we want 18, 25-year-olds. They're still in that youth age. And yet God's system is prepare a child by the time they're 13 to be a man of God. We wonder sometimes what the world looks like. And it's, it's, it's mannerless, isn't it? Men, young men, young women masquerading like men and women but having the hearts of children. They don't know. And when I say hearts of children, I mean poor-mannered, ill-mannered. Children are actually great. They, they're lovely. But I'm talking about this behavior where we've got adults acting like unmannered, ill-tempered adolescents who haven't been shown what it is to be a man or a woman. Do you know what age it is for a girl? She has between 12 and 12 and 6 months. And she is in youth. And at 12 and 6 months, she is now considered a woman. Anyone in that? Alia, how old? Can I ask? uh, You're 12. Are you right? Is that right? Oh, 16, that's right. 15. We'll get there. I got your name right, so let's go with that. That was a good score. All right. Give me a tick. Kobe, how old are you? 11. So at the moment, Kobe's sitting, sitting in that beautiful stage of being considered a child. But in about a year's time, he'll go into this age of youth. And then at 13 years, he'll be considered a man. For the, so, so there is validity for youth ministry. It's for six months of everyone's life. <laughs> Parents, our role, you know, you know, our role in the scripture says is train your children in the ways of the Lord and they shall not depart. You have 12 years to train them in the ways of God so that for the rest of their life, they live as young men and young women in the Lord. Or, you know, men and women, not just young men and young women. So 13 to 24, they were responsible God-fearing men using every tro- uh, opportunity, these Levites, to learn about God. Imagine that kind of culture where the young men, 13 to 24, come up and say, tell me more about God. I want to learn more about God. That's the culture we're looking for. From age 25, the Levites would then go into a five-year apprenticeship learning how to uh, do temple ministry. 
Imagine if every person in our community did a five-year Bible college learning how to bring people into the presence of God, not just study, but practical training. From the age of 30, they were on active duty in the temple or to their community, depending on where they were. Just because they were priests didn't mean they were inactive in priestly duties just because they were outside of the temple. No, if they weren't in the temple, they still had active duty in the community wherever they lived throughout Israel. So 30 to 50, they had this responsibility. And then once you reached 50, there was no retirement. If you're a servant of the living God, you're a servant of the living God until the breath goes away. Or or however it is. (laughs) So from 50, you're now involved in the training of the young people. In the 25 to 30 year olds. So if you're over 50, I want you to just show me your hand. Put your hand up. All right, right now. That's right. All right. There we go. You are now our trainers. Who's 25 around that age? 25? All right. So Kingsley, Tash, (laughs) Nikki. Your role, everyone here, is to train these three for the service of the Lord. And everyone younger as well. All right. Kingsley, get ready to be prepared. We're on a five-year journey of being servants in the, in the, of the living God. So there's no retirement. But what I want to focus here on really is understanding this, the attitude of these priests. And can you follow with me? Is everyone okay this morning? So the priests would come up to the temple many times to serve throughout the year. They would come out for multiple reasons. They'd be required to watch the sacrifices, stand to be involved in the sacrifices, to be worshipping. And being a Levite was a full-time role. God had a system, and the system for being selected for a role in the temple was called a lottery. Everyone heard of a lottery before? Some of the people in the 8.30 session yelled out, yes, we know what a lottery is. Don't admit that, Tash. And uh, (laughs) Oz Lotto, uh, what was the other one someone yelled out, Teresa? Uh, Yeah, Gold Lotto. (laughs) Sorry, I wasn't identifying anyone there. Oz Lotto, Gold Lotto. Uh, you know, but, but a lot, we understand what a lottery system is. It's chance, right? You put money in, you're in this raffle, and then a name is drawn out. But God had a lottery system, and the lottery system was all the names of a certain number of priests were in this bowl, and the high priest would choose out a number of names, or he'd pick out a name of who was going to be in service of the Lord just as day was about to break each day. And so he'd bring his his bowl down, and he'd look at the names. He'd put your name in there, Pastor Greg, and put your name in there, Tash. Now, of course, in this example, women weren't involved in this process, but it's okay. Put your name in. Put your name in there, Teresa. Fantastic, Pastor Ryan. And uh, sorry to the online team and anyone online who's trying to focus now because I'm wondering. June, chuck your name in there. All right. Everyone's had their name in. There you go, Aaliyah at 16 years old. I've got it right that time. And Kobe puts in, Nathan puts in. 15 years old, I got it wrong, so I'll get it right now. Sorry, Aaliyah. Riley puts in. So everyone puts their name in, and and then the high priest starts to bring out the names for active duty. Aaliyah, I'm terribly sorry. I will get this right. And so come up here. I'm going to select some names. Where A high priest puts the names in. He selects out Pastor Ryan Walland. Come onto the stage. Just give him a round of applause as he comes. He puts his hand in again and he selects out Mr. Scott Belshaw. Let's give him a round of applause. He puts his hand in again and he selects Alan Graham. All right. And then finally, and last but not least, it goes in. Now, there's nine involved in this process, but four for us. And then he puts his hand in again and it is Mr. John McNamara. Now, you can imagine, as these guys saw their names being extracted from this bowl, their excitement. Just, gents, just show me your excitement for a moment at being selected by the high priest. This, this, what was it? Do that again? That's a, yeah, that's right. The lottery system was not like the Oz Lotto. It was not like the Gold Lotto or anything Lotto. It was a divine selection. It was believed that the the Holy Spirit breathed upon the high priest. And as he selected, it was the people with the right attitude and the right heart. And so these guys were called and they were chosen. They were the right people. They were ready. And what would happen is that, that one of the other priests would start to prepare the sacrifice, right? He'd start to prepare and he'd be, you know, doing the skinning and the, and the preparing of the animal. 
and he'd give priest number one the wine to carry. So he's got the wine. And he'd give priest number two the bread to carry. And so now he's got the bread. Uh, Sorry that these aren't real objects, but imagine that they are. And he gives priest number three the head of the uh, lamb. And John's look. John faces it outwards and he smiles and they both look the same, you know. I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry. That wasn't very nice of me. That's, that's all right. That's all right. And then he comes to the, uh, the fourth priest and he gives him the, either the leg or some of the insides of the animal, but he receives it and they all receive it with joy. You know, they, they've, yay, just elation and joy. I've got these things to carry, you know. And so they line up and one by one they follow. So number one, number two, number three and four. And they follow, they walk with these items that they've got. All going from where this animal has been slaughtered. And they come all the way up to the altar again. Yes, I've done a nice little circle so you're all in order. That was the point. And they look towards the high priest. And he's standing there. And now a second lottery starts to take place. They don't know it, but the nine men who've just stood there before before the high priest, now nine new men come and stand behind them. So I'm going to select Tash, Nikki, Teresa, and Michelle. And when I say men, just for this example, please go with me on this, okay? All right. And they stood right behind them. And the role of this was that the Lord was assessing their heart of attitude When it came to serving him, if the Lord felt that their attitude was waning, that they weren't in the right place, that their heart was far from him, that they thought that this was now just a role, that they were just getting bored with the fact that they just carried the head and they wanted the wine. There was if there was any level of dissatisfaction, this, you know, hey, Uh, but if there was any level of dissatisfaction, it was probable that their name might not get picked again. And so the high priest would take basket he put his hand in and he pulls out and he looks at pastor ryan walland he says ryan i'm sorry to say it but your name has not been selected and so up in his place is now nikita (laughs) and she and he hands the wine to nikita (laughs) who has the you know smile and attitude and but what happened (laughs) and the and the flair She wasn't God's first choice, but she's definitely God's second choice today. (laughs) But Ryan had the opportunity. What went wrong? Ryan had an attitude issue. It might have been just subtle, but an attitude issue. Bad attitude. Bad. (laughs) My wife's giving me glares from over there. Mm. Sheepish. (laughs) Oh. Well, there you go. Any other dad jokes while everyone's on them? You know, <laughs> it wasn't from J- oh, Jazz. Well done. So, stop, stop, you guys. So, Pastor Ryan is now. You can go sit down, Pastor Ryan. You have now been replaced. You've now been replaced. God given call. God chose you. There was a window of opportunity. You took it, but now you're disqualified because of an attitude. Wow. Wow. Just. Called but not chosen, or called and chosen but then disqualified from being chosen. He took the window, he took his shot, he was not going to throw away his shot, but then he lost his shot. So then we come to Mr. Scott Belshaw, who's holding, what were you holding? The bread. Now he's been waiting all year to do this one job, this one task. And he stepped up, the high priest goes and puts his name, or goes to grab a name and he reads it out. He says, Scott Belshaw, you're selected again. Now, you would believe you wouldn't believe how often this happened, that the same name happened twice. And this is because it was divine by the Lord. The chances said it shouldn't happen twice, but it did happen twice because of his attitude. We come on to Mr. McNamara and he puts his name in, puts the hand in, draws out the name. Mr. McNamara, you've had the right attitude. You didn't, you didn't buck when the priest made jokes about you and your attitude <laughs> stayed in the right place. And <laughs> I knew I could get a hook somewhere. <laughs> And so he retained his position, and then it came to the last one, Mr. Alan Graham. He puts his hand in, draws it out. He says, Al, I'm very, very sorry, 
but something's wrong. Michelle's up. You're out. And so he hands over the insides of the animal to Michelle, who's elated to be handed these insides. The walk of shame. How can he live? Can we please give a round of applause to everyone who's been? Thank you, everyone. So the attitude is so important, plain and simple. When it comes to serving the Lord, just like these, these wonderful priests who had the opportunity, attitude is everything and attitude is important. You might be called, you might be chosen, but if your attitude is in the wrong place, God will just choose someone else. And we need to remember this because I might be a pastor, Ryan might be a pastor, but the moment that we allow our hearts to drift from God's plan, we got to remember that God's got someone waiting right there to step up and take our place. God's plans are not stopping for you. Our choice is our attitude ready to be used in whatever capacity God needs us. How do we know that this happens today even with disciples, not just Levites? Well, we know that God's hand was upon the disciples when they were looking for a new apostle to replace Judas. Acts 1.26, Peter's talking to the group who've gathered 120 men or so, it says in Acts 1.15. And it says, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. Really what Peter's saying here is, there was one man who's been a disciple the whole time, or two men at least. And these, one of these two will replace Judas who, uh, who betrayed Jesus. One of these men must become a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward the name of two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in his ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So what we have happening in the upper room is the apostles, 120 men or so, in the temple portico at Shavuot, at Pentecost, they're about to select the next apostle. How do they do it? They don't do it through... Uh, you know, they, they're not just praying at this point. Who are you choosing, Lord? They've chosen to use God's ordained lottery system and they put lots forward of these two men and out of it came Matthias. Now, 120 men is important at this point because we would say, couldn't we just cast lots for any, any godly decision? Not really. How the lottery system worked was through godly leadership. God appointed the high priest to be able to do it. He also appointed the heads or leaders of the communities to do it. When you have 120 men in a community, that's what's called a, a leadership over that's called a Beit Din or a house of judgment, which consists of three male elders. This is where Paul gets his idea of having three elders, particularly governing a community of around 120 men. And so this was a legitimate form of judgment or bringing about a God's decision. So where are we? Well, the temple might not be a place that you go to, and you might not be a Levite, but I can tell you that as people who are set apart and disciples of Jesus, we're called to bring this service to the world, aren't we? So the temple was not a place that the Levites would go to. It was, it was something that they were part of, and they served the Lord together. Community is not something you go to. It's something you are part of. You don't just go to church. You're part of the community of believers. And if you're part of the community of believers, we serve together, we love together, we outreach together. There's responsibility for, for, for something. We just don't do this journey alone and come and attend. We participate. And so I want you to look at your attitude. Is it where it needs to be? Have you taken the window of opportunity? Are you stepping in from where your community is or are you stepping out from it? Every one of us, like in the parable of the Murex, has something to bring. You've got the wonderful blue inside of you. You've got the recipe for holiness. But are you bringing it into the service of the Lord? Let me challenge you on this thought. God is our priority. Every one of us would probably believe that, don't you? God is your priority. But if God is your priority, He's placed you in a God-centered community. 
And in a God-centered community, it benefits you, it benefits your family, it challenges you. You're part of it, you sow into it, and in, in return, it's a blessing to you. Church is not somewhere you go, it's something you're part of because it's a community. If we're really to be the gathering that Jesus called us to be, it's something we do together. God's giving you this window of opportunity to be part of something very, very special. And he's calling you to step up. He's calling you to step in. And if you don't, just remember that his plan is not waiting on you. This is not judgment. But his plans are not waiting on your timing. He's not waiting back for you. He doesn't want you to miss out. He wants to give you the opportunity. He says, come, be involved with what I'm doing. But if you don't, that's okay. I've got the next person ready, lined up to go. So I say to our church family all the time, there are limited positions in our church community, in church and at the festivals. Don't be the person who wished they had more of a chance because they didn't take the spot. Don't throw away your shot. So if our attitude is right, what then is the responsibility that we're given? What should we be doing? Is it just singing Kumbaya and three song karaoke and you know, TED Talk every now and then. No, that's not what we do. The scripture's clear in Luke 19 verses 11. Come with me to this scripture, Luke 19 verses 11. This is a great scripture. Luke 19 verses 11 to 13. And as they heard these things, he added and spoke in a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Now what's happening here? is Jesus is being recognized as the Messiah and people are believing that the kingdom is now about to come. Jesus, They're thinking Jesus is about to crush the Romans. He's going to bring in full effect the Messianic age. And so he speaks a parable and he says, Therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy until I come. For some of you, it says, do business until I return. What is the business that Jesus is talking about for those who have the right attitude? What is the business that he's talking about? Because if we know we have to have our attitude right or else we're going to get replaced, what is the attitude serving? Are we holding the head of a lamb? Are we holding the casket of wine? Are we holding the bread that's going to be put on the burnt oil? What is it that we're doing to occupy until he comes? Very good, John. Thank you. What is it? Because there's a lot of good things we could be doing, isn't there? We could be feeding the poor. We could be washing people's cars. We could be, we could be doing any manner of things. We could, be, we could be building houses for people. What is the occupying that Jesus has in his mind? Don't you want to understand that? Occupy is short for, we use it in the, in the normal sense of occupation. So Jesus is saying, let this What's about to come next be your occupation. What is the occupation of a believer? Let's explore it together. Let's look at the Bible to determine this. Luke 2 verses 41. Come with me there. We're going to wrap this up very shortly. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. We're talking about the appointments of the Lord earlier. For Jewish people and Gentiles who are God-fearing Gentiles, every year these, these festivals of the Lord happened. And Mary and Joseph went to the feast of Passover, which was a seven-day period or an eight-day period. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. Jesus was just bordering on this youth age, or if not at the youth age that I mentioned earlier. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy stayed in Jerusalem. Jesus stayed in Jerusalem. What a lovely child. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. A day's journey is about 200 stadia, which is about... 20 uh, 20 to 30 kilometers so they went a whole day's journey only to realize at dinner time that he wasn't actually there then because they probably sat down as a family they're traveling with thousands of other people they sat down as a family to have a meal and they all looked around where's Jesus where's Yeshua where's our son where's he gone and all of a sudden they realize well we've gone 30 kilometers we've now got to go back 30 kilometers right so they headed back And it said after three days they find Jesus in the temple. And what's what's he doing? When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And mums in the room, tell me you wouldn't say this if your child's been missing for three days. Why have you treated us so? Is that the words that would come out of your mouth? 
What is it? Or would it be, son, <laughs> come here now. Or is that the father? I'm not sure. <laughs> Same words, different tone. That's right. How would you do it, Tash? <laughs> Spanish would come out at that point. We know she, she could be saying, I love you, but we don't know that because it just sounds threatening, you know? <laughs> Any ethnic language, you know. It's, and, the, and the woman said, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress, and it would be distressing. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Smart, smart boy. (laughs) Smart one, Jesus. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business or in my father's house? And they didn't understand what he spoke to them. But he went down with them to Nazareth and was submissive to them. This is a young man who's approaching that time of adulthood. He's now not just a youth in the way we think about youth. He's now Jesus, the man preparing to be Messiah. And I want to look at his attitude because occupying is being about the father's business. Jesus at 12 was being about the father's business. At the time of his readiness as a man, if not just before, he was making himself about God's business. His occupation under Jesus, son of Mary and Joseph, Jesus ben Yosef, or G- you know, however that looked, was profession about my father's business. Not carpenter, not bricklayer, not handyman, but about my father's business. What's your occupation? Is your occupation doctor? Is your occupation lawyer? Is your occupation mother or father? Or is your primary occupation about the father's business? Three days they were looking for him and Jesus at 12 years old realizes that he must be about the father's business. So he recognizes the call of God, you see. And he doesn't sit there and think, one day when I'm 30, I'm going to serve God. He doesn't sit there and say, one day when I'm financially dependent. I'll have a great ministry. One day when I'm the same age as at 25, I'll start serving and then I'll be ready. I'll be mature enough. One day when I've gained the respect of my peers. One day when I've finished my studies. One day when I have more time. One day when my children are grown up. Do you know the one day never comes, does it? It never arrives. We're great at saying one day when I'm big and strong, like one day, but it never arrives. One day never comes. And Jesus at 12 recognized that he had to seize that one day right then at 12 so that when he did reach the time of 30, he wouldn't be waiting for a ministry. He just stepped straight into it. He seized it as a 12-year-old. And at 13, and at 14, and at 15, and at 16, he didn't wait to be validated. He was about his father's business. John 5 verses 30, what is the father's business? And I want to come to a close shortly on this. I can do nothing on my own, Jesus says. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the one who sent me. Luke 19 verses 9, today salvation has come into this house, since he is also a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. John 6 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of the lost. And in verse 37 of that, he says, all the father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. The will of the Father. And it is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. In other words, the disciples who were given to Jesus, Jesus' will from the Father was to raise them up on the resurrection. His purpose was to see them believe that he is the Messiah and the Son of God and walk his disciples so that they might one day have resurrection. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. The business that you and I are in, friends, the business you and I are in is the will of the Father and that is that people would look on the Son And believe that he is both the son of God and the Messiah. And that they would then walk the discipleship life that they might be resurrected one day when he returns. But not everyone will be in that place. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone on that day will enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
but only those who do the will of my Father. What's your occupation? Does your occupation lead you to eternal life? Or does your occupation mean that you miss the window of opportunity? Today, friends, I want to come to a close. And I want to tell you that there is a second chance. For those of you today who are sitting there and thinking, I want the opportunity. I've I've missed the opportunity, but I want it. God is giving you a second chance. And he'll give you another chance. Another chance. It might not be the same as the window you've missed, but it'll still be an opportunity to enter into his plan. And today, if you've missed an opportunity, I want you to recognize and identify that in your heart. Today, would you stand with me? I'm going to ask you to, if you feel in a moment that you've missed a window of opportunity that God's given you, I want you to feel welcome to come down the front and do business with the Lord on that. First of all, it needs repentance. You missed it when He was calling and He chose someone else. But it's not to say that He won't give you another opportunity again. He does. He's a God full of mercy and there's plenty of opportunity to be involved in His plan.